Welcome. Nice to see you all. This is lovely. Um, so today we're here, I'm here, uh, the four of us, uh, for to present this webinar called Organizing for Tenant Power, How the Downtown East Side SRO Collaborative Developed the Tenant-Led Community Organizing Approach. Um, this is being put on by the Downtown East Side SRO Collaborative, which we're all a part of, um, and also with huge support and funding from the Community Housing Transformation Center. So without further ado, we're gonna get, get started. Yeah, um, so I wanted to acknowledge that the, um, the folks on this side of the screen, at least, are on the unceded and um, traditional lands of the Muskegon, Squamish, and tsleil And if uh, folks could just take a moment to reflect on the spaces they're in and um, think about the traditional land holders for uh, whatever land you're on, um, yeah, that'll help us to be able to move forward and do this work in a, in a good way. Uh, thank you. So there's four of us here today, as you can see. Uh, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Sibrit Sukting, and I was hired by the SRO Collaborative, <clears throat> excuse me, one year ago um, as a consultant to do an evaluation and knowledge transfer process uh, for one of their key programs. So we'll speak a bit more about that and what that means, but I've been here for about a year uh, as a part of this community. Hi, I'm Dee. I'm uh, living in the Cobalt. I've been a part of this, I think, for about a year as well. Um, it's nice to be here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Richard. I'm on the board of directors of the SROC, and I'm a tenant at the Arlington Hotel, and I'm a researcher for the Right to Remain. Um, my name is Brian Jacobs. I am um, a staff member at the SROC and I coordinate the Double O program and I work with Dee and Richard to uh, help support tenants in their buildings to organize and introduce some of the hub uh, services. So I'll just start today's webinar by sharing the purpose of our gathering here today. Um, so the purpose of the webinar is to share some of the findings of this one-year evaluation and knowledge transfer process that I've helped support. Um, CHTC, Community Housing Transformation Center, uh, was one of a number of key groups that provided startup funding for the SRO Hub program, which we're going to explain. Um, and they also provided instrumental financial and mentorship support for the evaluation of it. So as a final step, they've supported us to host this webinar so that other actors and organizations can learn from the SRO hub model that was developed at the collaborative um, and potentially replicate it in their communities where relevant. Um, our purpose today is really to speak to a wide audience. So whether you're a housing policymaker, a funder of community housing initiatives, um, or a tenant-based organization yourself, or a tenant yourself, um, or none of the above, <laughs> but it's really just to speak to a wide audience about uh, the skill focus work. <laughs> And so the agenda for today, we're gonna to start with SROC 101. So some of you might not ever have heard of SROC. So we'll give you some details and some key terms about uh, what we are and what we do. Um, and then we're gonna talk about our approach specifically. So the nuts and bolts of this program that uh, has started. Um, and then we're gonna talk about what we've learned. So partly sharing about the evaluation of this program and how we've found it to be successful or not. Um, and then we'll wrap up with a discussion, hopefully with all of you, we have a whole 20 minutes left us out at the end to hear your questions and comments um, and talk about maybe doing this work in your own communities. This is the SROC 101. SRO stands for single room occupancy. These um, hotels were actually built in the early 1900s and they were to house research, resource workers like loggers and fishermen and people in low wage jobs. Um, now it serves as low income housing. It's also known as the housing of last resort before homelessness. Don't get a tent just yet. They're uh, shared bathrooms and usually shared kitchens. The rooms are usually 10 feet by 10 feet. And uh, the rents range between $400 and $1,000. <clears> the shelter component of BC's income assistance has remained the same at 375. And I don't think we can find rent anywhere for 375. 
Uh, there are about 7,000 SRO units in Vancouver, and over half of these are privately owned. Many are in uh, really unsafe conditions, uh, are poorly managed, and there's always chronic pests such as cockroaches, flies, etc. There are broken fire safety systems, broken elevators, broken plumbing, and heating systems. About a third of the SRO tenants are indigenous, and about 85% of people on social assistance or on disability. And it's usually people facing multiple intersecting barriers to the traditional housing market. Downtown East Side is known as the poorest postal code in Canada. It is slightly east of the Vancouver's downtown core, and it encompasses Vancouver's Chinatown, Gathtown, and Strathcona neighborhoods. So as Richard has just explained, there's a very real risk of homelessness for every tenant living currently in a privately owned SRO unit. Um, not only are there no social supports for tenants living in these privately owned buildings, but tenants are at constant risk of eviction due to gentrification pressure and intense real estate speculation in this neighborhood. Um, as Richard said, many of them are in extremely poor conditions and many of them don't actually abide by the city's standard of maintenance bylaws. Um, so while the seemingly obvious solution is to shut these buildings down and provide better housing solutions, the reality is that these buildings currently provide really critical housing for quite a lot of people. Um, so the challenge now is to develop a sector-wide response to these problems that supports the needs of tenants right now while creating a more sustainable long-term uh, alternative housing solution. The SRO Collaborative is a grassroots nonprofit organization of SRO tenants and staff. We're all trying to work to improve the building conditions, the affordability, the health, and sense of safety and sense of belonging for tenants living in privately owned SRO buildings. Our long term goal is to support tenants to participate in decision making about the future of our homes. Why? B, would you explain that? Why are the SRO tenants organizing for change? As it is now, SRO tenants experience stigma and feel like they're stuck in the downtown east side with nowhere to go and no real opportunities for them. People feel like they've been let down so many times and they don't trust that they are supported. By organizing for change, SRO tenants can dream bigger and see the opportunities they do have can fight for an improved quality of life and a sense of belonging within its neighborhood and the world around them. Can feel more trust towards others and can fight for homes that are affordable and dignified. If we didn't do this work, we could be homeless or die. There would be disaster. Living here feels precarious all the time. So now we're gonna talk about our approach. So we've been talking about this program of the SRO Collaborative. It's called the SRO Hub Program. So there are three goals. The first goal is to prevent evictions and homelessness for tenants living in privately owned SROs. The second goal is to improve habitability, affordability, health, sense of safety, and sense of belonging. And the third is to create a new sector-based response around the future of the privately owned SRO hotels. And you can just see on the right there, there's a table that has all the buildings. So. <laughs> um, the SRO buildings on the right. So yeah, Richard, as you said, is from the Arlington um, and D is from the Cobalt. Those are two of the key hub buildings that we work in. Um, so yeah, really this is, it's actually a three year pilot program um, that creates an organization for tenants that's not connected to landlords or the property management. So it's quite unique in that way. Um, and the program layers multiple different tenant based initiatives in these eight buildings, which we'll get more into detail about in the next few slides. Yeah, so the um, the hub is based on a, uh, a tenant leader model that we've adapted from other organizing um, literature. So the idea is that each of our services are anchored by a tenant leader that we've um, identified in the building. So a staff person such as myself or one of our one of my other coworkers will start by doing door knocking in the building to get to know tenants and build relationships with them and start to pick who we think might be the lead tenants in the building. Um, and we wanna do this because 
the relationships that we're building in the um, building in the uh, SROs are really important for the tenants to be able to anchor those. Um, me as a staff person building relationships with their neighbors isn't as useful as me trying to delegate those relationships and get the tenants to be, be the ones doing the work in the buildings for themselves. Because then it becomes a much more grassroots model and it's not as imposed on the tenants. The model diagram. Oh, there's one more. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we we start by doing outreach in the buildings to identify potential leaders. And we use a lot of um, indicators to try to tell if the person we're talking to is a potential leader. Um, so this could be someone who is already um, organized to some capacity to either advocate for their neighbors, um, someone who has a lot of capacity to either like maintain their own phone bills, someone who has like maybe a bit of a cleaner room. Um, and it can be a lot of difficult, it can be very difficult to recruit the tenant leaders sometimes because they aren't in need of much assistance. And that's key because those are the, the leaders that are able to help their neighbors so that they are able to um, use their extra capacity to um, yeah, make the buildings a better place. Um, and then once we have the tenant leader identified, we start um, getting them to do surveys with their neighbors to um, identify um, different services that maybe aren't um, in the buildings yet or gaps that they can um, that we can start uh, um, intervening in. Um, and then we all um, then that moves into what's called structured tests, which is a way for us to gauge the support level in a building. So by doing subsequent surveys or having meetings we can actually gauge participation and our support levels in the building to figure out if we are growing support or if support is waning for the tenant committee that we're introducing. Um, then tenants are able to um, invite their neighbors to SRO degree classes, which we put on. We have uh, 10 classes so far. And once the tenants um, go through all 10, they graduate. And there's a bonus facilitation class that they can take after they've graduated in order for them to start teaching the SRO degree classes themselves. Um, and we've had a lot of um, success with the tenants teaching their neighbors and their neighbors being more receptive to the information when it comes from a peer rather than a staff person. Um, and the idea here is for their network that the tenants build um, of their relationships and stuff in their building to start delegating a lot of the tasks. So that will be to like, Instead of the tenant leader maybe taking their neighbor out for coffee, maybe them getting other people to do one-on-ones and check-ins and just really reinforcing the, the relational networks in the building and the way that information flows into the building and also out of the building into community for us to be able to connect them to resources and supports. And, uh, no, I, yeah. Is there another slide? That's uh, pretty so, Oh, yeah. Sorry. The <clears throat> delegation is... Uh, being able to uh, identify tenants in the building when roles come up. And as a tenant leader, I can bring in new tenants into the organization as my position in the O. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. So the, the whole hub project is based around these tenant-based initiatives, which are um, designed to really um, they're, they're designed with the idea of mutual aid and the history of mutual aid and to support the tenants to be able to do service delivery for each other. Um, so the lead tenants that we identify will anchor one of the tenant based initiatives and those can be anything from food delivery. Um, we have we're designing one around fire response. We have um, the bolts which do light maintenance in each other's uh, rooms. The organizers, which are uh, the ones that I support. Um, so the tenants really are looking out for one another and they're the, um, in charge of actually bringing the resources into the building and distributing them to where they need, to, to, to the neighbors that need them most. Um, yeah, so the tenant-based initiatives, um, the idea of the hub is to try and get all of the tenant-based initiatives um, layered into the hub building simultaneously while trying to get the tenants to um, take control over any decision-making that would be involved in the delivery of the tenant-based initiatives. 
So that can be what task they do first. That can be what order they do the surveys in. There's a lot of um, decisions that get made in the delivery of these tenant-based initiatives, and we want the tenants to feel empowered um, when they make those decisions. Um, great. <clears throat> so the tenant-based initiatives, the model and the, the diagram that we're using, uh, these tenants in a part of the organizing, organizing committee, each one of them does a tenant-based initiative in their building. And all the tenants who receive these supports make up the general tenant building committee who participate in building-wide organizing, such as petitions. Um, yeah, one of the initiatives is our food program where uh, indig indigenous peoples in the building get uh, groceries delivered uh, once a week, as well as uh, getting hot meals for the whole building um, delivered to tenants weekly. Another um, initiative is the BOLTS, uh, Building Operations Led by Tenants, which is maintenance and housekeeping, which tenants take the initiative in the building and help in their community. And as Brian spoke about the SRO degree, these are 10 education modules on topics like tenants' rights, dealing with evictions, how to communicate with landlords, etc. TORO is another good program. Tenant overdose response organizers. It's harm reduction for people who use drugs and overdose prevention training and the Loxon distribution. <laughs> as well as Uyan Gak, which is uh, indigenous tenants connected with indigenous elders of the, their same nation and mentorship, cultural support, indigenous medicine and healing. And the double O's who are the connectors in the buildings and they survey tenants, direct them to tenant-based initiatives and other community resources. Or double O's. Yeah. <laughs> or double O's. Say, yeah. <laughs> Looking at them. Yeah. So like I had said earlier, the, the goal of the hub project is to really try to get the tenants involved in decision-making, which is a big and nebulous task to do, but we're trying to find ways of um, facilitating those decision-making processes and also trying to find ways for tenants to build more relationships with their neighbors. So ways that we can do this um, are by throwing community barbecues for tenants to come out of their buildings and cook for each other and share stories about um, how they fix problems in their buildings or even identify problems that maybe they don't know about in their buildings. Um, and they're really, really great ways for tenants to just get to know people that maybe they haven't met in their buildings and to really kind of look out for another one another. Um, we also do a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, chats and conversations, which are like structured organizing conversations that I do weekly with the double O's to try and help them to identify the problems in their buildings and to figure out what resources and supports they can refer their neighbors to, while also teaching them how to do organizing conversations so that they can then do that with their neighbors um, and take their neighbors out for coffee and do one-on-ones and really build up the team in their building of um, who, who can be involved in the decision-making. Um, we've also had a lot of success when a issue is identified um, using really nicely worded letters or petitions um, to try and encourage the landlord to hear the tenant's perspective. Um, on the screen there is an example um, that Richard actually uh, was in charge of. And I think you'll tell you a little bit more about it now. Yeah, um, we didn't have any laundry facilities in the building. And uh, there used to be three laundromats close by within you know a few minute walk. Then there was two, and there was one, and then there was none. Mm -hmm. So after that happened, you would have to take like a you know 15, 20 minute bus ride either east or west to get to the nearest laundry facility. So we decided maybe why don't we petition our landlord and see uh, what happens. And we did a petition there, as you can see up on the right hand of your screen. Uh, we got about 85% of our building to sign up for it. And after a week, uh, the landlord agreed to put uh, a washer and dryer in the building. And we had some success here. And we're putting in an affordable internet plan, which is going to save a lot of money for the tenants coming into our building. It's going to be a really great idea for everybody there to not have to worry about, you know, 
the price of internet plans and they can all pitch what they can and it'll always uh, work out because uh, it's really horrible. Mm -hmm. it does. And maybe just for people who are listening, if they're not aware, like this is, is this with the landlord or without? This was around the landlord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't through the landlord. Yeah. Mostly, yeah, it's just tenant. Yeah. 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 I think actually that's a really good point that we haven't um, really hammered in is yeah. that a lot of all of the um, tenant based initiatives work with the tenants. Um, so the landlords in some buildings might not know or they might even be hostile to some of the work that the tenants are doing. But we work with the tenants to um, navigate these issues and try to make sure that they're protected from any potential backlash from their landlords. And we try to make sure that these programs are running to serve the tenants, um, regardless of whether or not the landlord wants them to be in the buildings. <laughs> and uh, learning these organizing skills has helped me um, speak at City Hall, for instance, for vacancy control which uh, I don't know if we're going to touch on to that, but we probably will touch on vacancy control and what it means here and what it means to tenants. It's, it's, good, time. Time. it's a good time. We <laughs> <laughs> well, vacancy control is a rent control policy um, that the tenants advocated for. And a lot of the work the double O's were doing during that time was engaging their neighbors and explaining the idea of vacancy control to the tenants in their buildings. Um, and the idea of vacancy control is that we have vacancy decontrol in our rent control regime right now, which means that when a tenant moves out of a building, the landlord can raise the rent by as much as the market can bear. And vacancy control was a policy that we won at the city level to put um, to control rents um, in the SROs when the tenant vacates. Um, unfortunately, that was overturned by a court and we're going through an appeal process, but it was really, really nice to see Richard got to speak at City Hall, and even if, I, if that was a little bit before he got involved, but she would be speaking at City Hall if he was, <laughs> that she was there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to say anything else, Richard, about that process of speaking at City Hall? Um, well, I learned a few things about my civic duties here. Um, yeah, it was, it was quite interesting to actually get input from politicians. And uh, like uh, Brian had said, we won vacancy control, but unfortunately, um, two landlords didn't agree with it, as most landlords probably wouldn't agree with it anyways, because we're scraping into their money-making schemes here. So um, we're in the appeal process right now, so we're keeping our fingers crossed that uh, it goes in the, the uh, tenant's favor. Mm -hmm. So as kind of a final wrap up to the approach section here, um, I wanted to tie it all into the bigger the bigger system. So SROC really does act as a coordinator for the whole sector um, and really is advocating for system change and has had pretty big successes in doing that. Um, so as an example, um, SROC has really coordinated between multiple different levels of government, especially the city recently, um, and community partners and tenants and sometimes landlords as well. So they've kind of been that in between that's able to, uh, you know, increase the flow of information and resources between all these groups in the right directions. So yeah, the first point there, they really have changed the flow of resources information. For example, the government um, has reported to us that they do have a better understanding of these buildings now and a better understanding of the needs of tenants in those buildings. Um, there's also been a demonstrated influence on policy decision making as Richard and Brian spoke to with vacancy control. Um, there's also been now uh, obvious changes in practices among government and landlords. One example uh, within the SROC is that some landlords now actually call the SROC um, when a tenant might be evicted um, so that they can help at the beginning to sort of make that process a better one and maybe find alternative uh, housing for that tenant. Um, fourth, SROC has definitely shifted the power dynamics. Um, so up until now, voices of SRO tenants were not really included in policy decision-making at City Hall and in other contexts as well. And then finally, uh, we do think that this has changed the way the system looks at tenants in, at, at large. So not just passive social service recipients, but really people that are, that are making change and that are actors in the creation of a more sustainable, just housing uh, solution. And it's working. Yes, and it's working. <laughs> and it's working. <laughs> Something we've learned. So um, now we're going to transition to our final section here, which is what have we learned? 
So as I said earlier, I have been a part of an evaluation process for the past year with Astro Collaborative. So I'll share some of that here. So the questions we were most curious about with this evaluation, well, first I'll just say that the program had been running for two years um, and it's, it was sort of intended as a three-year pilot project. So it was sort of a developmental evaluation to see um, you know, what we were observing so far and what were the challenges and successes and the, the place we're going to move towards. So the questions were, are we achieving our goals of the program? Two, are we seeing increased tenant participation and decision-making through this program? And three, are we contributing to system change for the XRO sector? So how we answered those questions, um, I did 24 different interviews with staff, city partners, other community partners, and tenants. Um, we did 40 building surveys that Dean, Richard, and others helped disseminate to tenants in their buildings. There were 40 completed. Um, and we did four focus groups that were also co-facilitated by tenant leaders um, with other people in their buildings to try and uh, ask these questions. And then finally, there were regular meetings of a tenant evaluation committee, which Dean and Richard were a part of, um, and that met monthly over the past year with about 15 lead tenants. Um, and we just talked about some of these questions and talked about how the program was going. So in terms of the findings, I'll just say at the front that this is a little tiny snippet. And if you're curious and wanna learn more, we will have our second webinar two weeks from now. This is a little plug already. Um, so come tune into that one if you wanna learn more. But as a little quick snapshot, some of the successes that we identified through this evaluation process were that SRO Hub tenants definitely feel less isolated. That was a huge theme. Folks that were participating in this program felt more connected to their neighbors and more um, empowered in their buildings. Um, the second thing we noticed was there definitely was uh, achievement of the goals of the program. So we were definitely seeing improved habitability, affordability, health, sense of safety, and sense of belonging for most, if not all, tenants that were participating in the program. And then third, uh, like Richard and Dee have spoken about, we definitely were seeing increased visibility and inclusion of tenants, in particular with the City of Vancouver's decision-making and policy processes. And then in terms of challenges, some of these have been mentioned already. So definitely landlord backlash is a big one. Sometimes when tenants do become more active in their buildings. Or empowered. Yeah, empowered. There's this risk that that then threatens a landlord. So there has been some examples, maybe you can speak to any, but like some examples of landlords saying, you know, if you're part of this program, I'm going to kick you out or evicting tenants for, for doing that, some of this work. Um, any stories you want to share? Or? They kick them out for any reason, and this is just the perfect reason, you know, it's like the cherry on top because uh, they don't need any trouble, and the last thing they need is, yeah, sober trouble coming at them through the door with a letter and, you know, their glasses on. It's just not the kind of trouble that they want to see around, mm -hmm. and just, yeah, they're already kicking people out for no reason whatsoever, so, mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't take much. Yeah, it doesn't take much. Yeah. Well, I think that um, really underlines the fact that we gave ourselves three years because it needs to be very slow and deliberate when you're starting something like this up in order to mitigate that landlord backlash and mm -hmm. anticipate it and kind of inoculate the tenants to that. Um, meaning that like you have to name it and you have to tell tenants to expect it before it ever happens and make sure that they're going into this organizing with sober eyes and not over really high expectations, which is the next point. Perfect segue, <laughs> Brian. <laughs> the next point I was going to say that we identified as a challenge of the program was high expectations from tenants in particular. Um, a lot of people do want to see change and they're they're like kind of impatient for it, of course, because the conditions in these rooms are inhumane, oftentimes unjust. And so when you have these high expectations and there's this potential to have change, it can be really frustrating to have some of that shut down um, or met with resistance from landlords or others. So well, and also the, yeah. the community is calcified. Like there's, it's so stuck in the way things happen that if you move things too fast, you actually um, can overturn the apple cart and disrupt other networks in the buildings that people rely on. So you have to be very deliberate because like not only is there potential for landlord backlash, but you could also get potential backlash from other tenants in the building who rely on some of these informal economic systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, another challenge identified was uh, wanting to make sure that the program avoided that service provider mentality. 
it can be quite common, especially in the downtown east side, for um, organizations to kind of fall into that trap of just providing a service to, to someone, especially someone who's lower income, um, and not kind of understanding that they also have their own agency and they have their own vision for um, their life and their community and their buildings. So it's kind of that constant, um, that sort of constant balance of, of course, there's 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 flow flow of funding and resources and supports, but also wanting to make sure that this organization remains grassroots and remains tenant led. Right? Where we're we're not like oh go stand in the queue there right go wait for yeah. your piecemeal gift here and mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to stay away from that that model because yeah. uh, we need change and that model doesn't you know it just provides the status quo. Yeah. And we want to be different from that. We have a different learning curve here. So power to the people. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, another challenge was that of piecemeal funding. The reality of this kind of landscape is that oftentimes there isn't availability of like core funding to support this kind of mission. Um, so the SROC really does struggle with administrative uh, funding, like it can be really hard for the admin team to balance all these small pots of funding that come in. Um, so in the long term, there's definitely a need for more sustained core funding, whether that's from a government or, or otherwise. And then, yeah, finally some adaptations. So based on all of that, all the stuff that we learned, um, there's definitely some things where the SRC has pivoted their approach. So one is kind of like what Brian spoke about with landlords. Initially, there was more of a uh, like legal approach uh, with landlords so really pushing landlords to comply with the standards of maintenance bylaws that they were not complying with um, and then that actually ended up causing some really bad backlash and retaliation if either of you want to speak to that well one thing um is we uh quoted what i would say <laughs> poking the bear okay we did not want to poke the bear which is the landlord but we did want to wake the bear up somewhat so uh to avoid I like Brian had said, doing this in a, a longer term, like a three years, we can slowly wake up the bear from its hibernation and not, you know, get our faces ripped off or, or worse. And then we found out that this actually works, and um, we're we're quite happy that we haven't been ravaged by the bear. And the bear's actually been cooperative now, at least in the building that I live in. Yeah, yeah, and I think another angle of it is that we learned that um, these buildings are in such dire conditions, a lot of them, that approaching it from a compliance kind of angle um, could lead to building closures because the buildings are in such conditions that there is no potential for compliance. So um, yeah, that can also be a, another backlash that we need to try to mitigate. Totally. And specifically for the folks that are listening that don't know of this history, there was initially this um, advocacy uh, for two specific buildings that had really bad conditions that the SROC was a part of and many ten tenants were a part of, including Richard. Um, and it did end up in the closure, the forced closure of two buildings by the city, as Brian's alluding to, because they just did not at all meet any standards of maintenance. Like it was totally falling apart and not safe living conditions. So of course the city was trying to do a good thing by shutting down those buildings, but it ended up causing uh, much more homelessness. Um, so that's sort of partly this adaptation now to shift to more cooperative landlord relations. So by no means does the program like work with landlords directly, but of course, when possible, I think that's where tries to engage them in a good way um, mm -hmm. and develop positive relations. Negotiation. Negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then a second adaptation was, yeah, learning that the tenant-based initiative structure. So having these support things, whether it's food or Toro, uh, the harm reduction or the maintenance programs, those structures in place have really facilitated more decision-making. So I think that wasn't totally clear at the beginning of the program, but having those tenant-based structures in place helped provide a platform for tenants to then make more decisions uh, in their buildings. Yeah. And then finally, um, <laughs> let's find our screen here. The final adaptation is that um, there's been this uh, developed understanding of the potential of a land trust model um, in addressing some of these challenges. So the SRO Collaborative, now recently, it's a huge success, has actually started the land trust with, in partnership with several other um, indigenous led and other uh, local community organizations. So we can speak more of that at a later date, but it's been a really interesting way to see that a land trust could be a really good model for doing some of this work that we're talking about. Um, yeah, anything else to say there? Just, well, this repositioning the from a private market into something that's got more tenant control mm -hmm. and 
really facilitating the empowerment and agency that we've been building up through the TBIs and actually giving it more substance and really kind of giving the tenants more control through the land trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So I think that's all we've got for that piece. So I just want to take a second to say thank you so much for listening. I think we're about at time, maybe we're a little bit under, which is nice. Um, we're now here to chat. We like things to be informal. So we would like to really have a, a discussion. All of us are here to answer any questions you have or discuss how you might implement something similar in your community. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know, Lee, I guess you're monitoring the chat, but I haven't taken a look. So feel free to let us know if there is stuff in the chat. Yeah, a few people were asking about a recording of this session. So it is being recorded and uh, we can definitely send that out to everyone who is here if that, that seems to be something that folks are interested in. Wonderful. That's great. Thanks, Lee. Great. Yeah, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to either raise your hand physically or do the, the button. Or just jump in. Or just jump in. <laughs> 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 I think they understand. Yeah, they get it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know one of the owners came to the right to remain last night? I heard. Yeah. <laughs> heard about that. Yeah, interesting. Okay, it looks like Darius has raised their hand. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the presentation. This was really great information. Um, my name is Darius Proust. I'm calling in from traditional um, Musqueam, Tawasan, and Claytooth land here um, West Vancouver. Uh, I, I work with the First Nations Health Authority um, and the Vancouver Coastal Regional Team <clears throat> as a regional advisor. Um, and so I've uh, met with Wendy before and we exchanged a lot of emails. Um, but I um, uh, I'm curious about um, something Wendy had mentioned in the chat um, about um, there being 100 um, SROs owned by private landlords, um, and then you have uh, programming in about 60 of these. Um, do you have programming in um, any of the other SR SROs that are not um, owned by private landlords? Um, and somewhat related to that, um, could you talk a bit about um, what the different, how how the programming looks a bit different in um, the your kind of eight um, hub buildings uh, versus the rest of the uh, SROs that you have programming in? Thank you. Great. Yeah, great questions. Um, do you want to do the first one? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm sure Wendy probably has some stuff to chime in about this. Um, we like none of the hub buildings are um, publicly owned. Um, I think there are some TBI services that end up getting um, directed into some nonprofit buildings, but we keep that to a minimum because uh, the, a lot of the nonprofits already have services that they deliver to their tenants or they have funding for services already. And we, we don't really want to step on each other's toes I, I, is kind of the gist of it, I think. Mm -hmm. Wendy, if you have more to add, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Mm -hmm. um, hi, Darius, and hi, everybody. You did a fantastic job on the presentation. Um, so yeah, how does it look different? So we're in, in these eight hub buildings. Uh, we've really integrated a lot of programming as a test pilot in these 500 rooms, like these guys explained. Um, and we've really put a, all of our eggs in these 500 rooms. And that's been a great uh, uh, opportunity for us to show what we can do if we can get the resources that we need for all of these programs. And then outside of the eight buildings, it's mostly Toro the tenant overdose response organizers that are that are in some of those other uh, buildings. Um, also, you can gack. Um, so Rhonda, our elder is definitely she concentrates a lot on the hub buildings, the tenants in the hub buildings, but she's also reaching a little bit beyond. And same with our food sovereignty 
the food, the hot meal program, that's also going in some of the other buildings, not just the hub buildings. And also the Chinatown buildings, there's eight, there's 10 um, benevolent society owned and some, some not benevolent society owned uh, buildings with people who speak Chinese and uh, Vietnamese. Um, so those 10 buildings are included in the 60. And we're starting to amp up our, our organizing in those buildings this year. So the other, you know, so that's about, we're in about 60 altogether, um, very heavily in the eight and then a little bit lighter, lighter touch in the others. But we'd like to expand because we think this is a good model and scale up. Um, but there's, uh, and we've recently put in a proposal to the, the ministry um, to expand. And we also, um, uh, because we've been able to concentrate on these eight buildings, we were able to develop a pretty close relationship with one of those la landlords in that owns about three or four of those eight buildings. And he has given us the right of first refusal on his properties um, if we the land trust wants to buy them. So we're trying to come up with a way to ease these buildings out of the private market basically, but not necessarily put them right into the supportive housing system because I think tenants want something a little different but I don't know if that answers your question Starius. and the only thing I think I'll add Wendy is like the the element of like landlord backlash and hostility the 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 nonprofits I wouldn't say they're hostile but they they definitely think that they have their services that they want to provide so it, it's a little bit more prickly to try and get in those buildings. Yeah, actually, there's one nonprofit that is operating some of the privately owned hotels, and we are in those buildings with our harm reduction program, for sure. Um, but for the most part, we just, we're really scared that we're going to lose these privately owned hotels because there's a pipeline for these tenants directly from their hotels onto the street into shelters, into the supportive housing system. So we're trying to hang on. The purpose of the collaborative is to hang on to these privately owned hotels until we can transform them into better housing for the future. Um, and there isn't a lot of new housing coming, so we can't afford to lose them. But thanks, Brian. That was good. Thanks, Darius, for your question. It's great. And in case anyone doesn't know, Wendy is the executive director and the founder of That's Row Collaborative. <laughs> um, anyone else have any questions or comments? One thing that I might want to add, if there's no question, no mm -hmm. comments, is just um, that the the TBIs that we've come up with so far are in no way like an exhaustive list of all the applications and we're constantly <laughs> coming up with new tenant-based initiatives that we might be able to try out so and it's really an, an interesting function of the tenant committees and the organizing that the double o's do to listen to their neighbors and hear what service gaps exist so that we can develop new tbis collectively and then go try to implement them yeah. also um on our we have 10 modules that we teach for the SRO degree and we're adding to that to um, I think another one will be about fire safety because mm -hmm. uh, there's been a far too many fires in SROs here in the last mm -hmm. uh, I'd say over the last year and a half mm -hmm. and a few where there were fatalities and it's unfortunate but everybody needs to know about fire safety and fire safety in the buildings like some people don't know where the fire extinguisher is or what doors should be closed or what not to do and uh it's very interesting there's a, a whole lot of subtext to that too in, in just safety in general or even heat response last summer oh that too there um, with the heat waves that are happening and the increased temperatures we um have got tenant leaders to distribute water and check in on some of their elderly neighbors to make sure that they're managing the heat okay and also providing um fire safety first aid training to uh, the lead tenants in their buildings to um, just support tenants and identify heat stroke symptoms and just to kind of keep the person safe while they wait for the ambulance to get there. Yeah. 
there's so much to say, you guys. Hey, I just want to ask you so many questions too. Um, but I have one for you, Brian. Um, if you suddenly moved to Prince Rupert or Kamloops, would you be able to start up something like this somewhere else? Is it possible? I, I've I never think, asked you that question. This is totally impromptu, but I, I, I think to... the, the 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 theories hold true anywhere. Um, some of the resources that are available in the downtown east side makes it um, the perfect place to experiment with these kinds of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think the the concepts of TBIs and the concepts of tenants doing work for each other um, is widely applicable. The like I said, the issue is like the availability of resources for those lead tenants to be able to bring in and redistribute and how they're accessing that. Um, and then organization like the SROC is just the perfect little entity to be able to go and do that support work for the tenants to get the bundles of money or to like do that admin support to get the resources to bring into the buildings um, and also just like to provide coaching and support to the tenants, um, even emotionally. Sometimes tenants have disasters that happen in their buildings and they'll call me and I just need to listen and help them work through it and come up with a plan for what to do next. And I think uh, this could be applicable anywhere in BC because uh, about 50% of our province rents. So we've got, you know, half the people are, are tenants. Mm -hmm whether it be in an SRO or an apartment or wherever, um, this can apply there as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the, um, the current BC housing model for renting and supportive housing um, works for certain people, but I think it leaves a lot to be desired for most folks that live in those buildings. Mm -hmm. And also there is still an assumption that a lot of rental buildings in other parts of the province are short-term or temporary um, solutions for folks who will eventually be able to move on and buy property. And that model just isn't true anymore. So I think that the, the housing system hasn't really caught up with some of the realities of the current economy. Definitely. Yeah. We have 10 more minutes, Richard. Could you tell us about the, your walk, like your walkthrough um, with, oh, the, with fire the fire educator. <clears throat> yeah, just like tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yes, uh, we had a, a fire, I think he used to be a fire inspector, but he worked with the fire department and uh, basically gives us a, a walk about, uh, and it was scheduled to be about 45 minutes, but uh, in the Arlington, <laughs> we kind of hung on to him for about an hour and a half because we were so interested in, in, you know, we did a walkabout through the building. So just finding out about, uh, you know, fire safety, fire drills, uh, and, and asking lots of questions because there was, I think five of us were with this fella, Chris, and he, you know, was, was actually quite happy that we had so many questions because, you know, we are inquisitive and we do want to know about fire safety because people's lives depend on it. So yeah, we did have a, a big walkabout with him, like in, in the building itself, outside the front of the building, talking about fire hydrants and hoses and uh, stuff that, you know, some of us were kind of ignorant about it because we just didn't know, so hence all the questions. Um, we, we also went to the back and uh, sometimes it's a bit of a fire hazard out back because there's a few pyromaniacs in the neighborhood, which isn't funny, but uh, uh, there, there was a, 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 one of a Smith right out back had lit on fire and there was like a 12 foot flame mark on the building across the, the way from us. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fire guy hadn't seen it until we walked to the back. And I, luckily we have cameras out back to, you know, just mm -hmm. to, keep an eye on anything that might light up because our, our building is made of wood, 100 year old wood that's probably like kindling. It's mm -hmm. very dry. Yeah, and termite holes for my animation. animation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so 
it was good to have the the fire safety guy there and um you know teaching us um stuff that we didn't know and and we know that the he's also going to go move on to another building in maybe about had wendy had mentioned that the same landlord owns uh mm -hmm. four or five of the buildings that are in our our hub mm -hmm. and uh it, it's good to have that information passed on to the other other tenants that are there and which would make mm -hmm. us at some point want to have uh, a fire safety drill in our building and uh, we're in preparations to getting that together. Mm -hmm. So that's great, Richard. Thanks for sharing. That also reminds me too. I mean, I would love for more questions people have them, but until we have any more, and if we don't, I'll just we'll just keep chatting <laughs> at you all. Um, but another point that I think is relevant there is that part of the model of the hub, and maybe partly why it's called hub as well, is because it really is like Richard's saying. Um, connecting tenants both within those buildings, but also between the buildings. So like when they're learning something about fire safety or what's going on in the city, it's then sort of this network that's being developed to share that with other tenants. So it really does kind of, it's sort of this like- Spokes in the hub. Yeah, spokes. totally. Spokes in the hub, yeah. Well, and I think of it like parallel processing because each building is having a different suite of problems and they come up with their own solutions. Mm -hmm. And by having um, more meetings between buildings, the tenants get to share their solutions and apply things that might have worked in one building or try it out in another building, figure out if it works. Um, and a lot of the problems are pretty common, but because the solutions are so different, it's kind of neat to be able to have all of these brains working on it in all of these separate ways simultaneously. Yeah, because yeah, one, you know, one building is different in that respect, another building is different in that respect. And if I'm just talking about the Arlington and one-on-one -on -one with Brian, uh, you know, we come up with solutions about how to do things, but it might not work in Dee's building because there's just a total different dynamic mm -hmm. in the building and different tenants and different things going on. I think it's more the process of teaching people to not just sit there and take everything that's coming at them and have no response and to teach them it doesn't matter what your response is as long as you know that the process of getting up and thinking you know what can I do about it is there and that's what it I think generalized over all the buildings has taught everybody well, and then they you know have the other big to, thing about organizing is you don't always get it right the first time yeah sometimes yeah. our first plan doesn't work and we yeah. have to recalibrate yeah. <laughs> right you know we all learn from our mistakes right and we try to correct it somehow by taking an alternative route. And we're always learning new things too. Oh, yeah. That's the good thing about it. Yeah. yeah. Just gonna exchange of information. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Lord. Great. I think we're, we're running out of time soonish, right? So feel free to wrap up whenever we need to leave. But it's been a real pleasure to have all of you here. And any final comments we welcome. Wendy, did you have one? Um, just that maybe you want to talk about the tenant convention that's coming up. Oh, yeah. Tenant convention. Do you you well, we've had a couple meetings and it looks like it's going to be a good one. We were going through the applications for the workshops and they sounded really good. A lot of medicine healing circles, uh, a lot of good ideas for, you know, um, just good ideas, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> good ideas for everything. Uh, it was, um, we didn't even get through them all, but they were really fun to listen to. And it's going to be fun. I can't wait. Totally. So yeah. yeah, just for some context, last yeah. week we had a call for ideas, which we opened up to any tenant in any SRO to bring workshop ideas or performance ideas or art installation ideas to really showcase the talent of the SRO tenants. And the convention, which will happen in May, will be a full day of um storytelling and workshops and information exchange um between tenants so that uh, just to really create more of a sector identity um across all of the buildings and it's uh, a key partner of the SRO collaborative is the right to remain research collective um they do really great work documenting and uplifting the stories of SRO tenants so they're helping to put that on. Uh, and I think like Brian said, it will be this coming summer in Vancouver. And it really, really will be kind of like a conference, but just for SRO tenants to just share their knowledge and their expertise with each other um, to support each other to thrive uh, in the settings that they live in. Yeah, it's exciting. You're right. We had, we had a really cool event this past week, getting these ideas from people. And people, I don't know if you remember any ideas, but they were really cool. Um, I remember a lot of them because we just ran over them. But um, mostly yeah, I'm just getting together to talk about how to heal, deal with things, mm -hmm. and just how to process the things going on around you and mm -hmm. how to feel at home with um, where you are with them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. To feel comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. What was, did you make a workshop that you wanted to do? I do. Yeah. Mine turned into a really uh, interesting one because someone had told me about a workshop that Ikea has where you tell this guy the problems in your apartment and then he'll put together like a kind of redo and like it's kind of a new apartment, like apartment makeover. So we were thinking a lot of the tenants can take on a lot of the problems. They, you know, figure out how to do all these home improvements and make a real nice, you know, cozy. Fun. Yeah. Organization. So, yeah, exactly. But yeah. like a home redo kind of show. Yeah. Yeah. There could be some really good uh, finished projects. I'm that's, hoping there are. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. And a lot of journals and like kind of, you know, Grief Circle was one of the best ones, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that was my favorite. Uh, uh, some just good ideas. Totally. Some tenants wanted to hold a grief circle with each other to process loss that they've experienced. So that will probably happen at the convention as well. Yeah. One of the tenants wants to do breathing exercises. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Help de-stress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so Thanks. much. Yeah. As well as musicians. We're trying to get some music lined up too. Yeah. If Maybe. you know anybody. <laughs> um, thanks so much all for your time. I'm recognizing I think we're just out of time now. So We'll wrap up, uh, make sure people have time to get their next thing. But feel free to say thanks. But on behalf of thank all of us, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Be in touch. Have a good day.